Residency, Wikipedia article audio. Residency is a stage of graduate medical training. A resident or house officer is a physician who practices medicine, usually in a hospital or clinic under the direct or indirect supervision of an attending physician. Successful completion of a residency program is a requirement to obtaining an unrestricted license to practice medicine in many jurisdictions. Residency training may be followed by fellowship or subspecialty training. Terminology History Afghanistan Argentina Colombia France Greece Mexico Pakistan Spain United Kingdom History 2 Post-2005 United States Specialty Selection Application Process Factors Written in Interviews The Match Ranking Match Day SOAP Changing Residency History of Long Hours Adoption of Working Time Restrictions Whereas medical school teaches physicians a broad range of medical knowledge, basic clinical skills, and supervised experience practicing medicine in a variety of fields, medical residency gives in-depth training within a specific branch of medicine. A physician may choose a residency in anesthesiology, ophthalmology, cardiothoracic surgery, dermatology, emergency medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, neurology, neurosurgery, obstetrics, and gynecology, otolaryngology, pathology, pediatrics, plastic and reconstructive surgery, psychiatry, physical medicine, and rehabilitation, radiology, radiation oncology, oral and maxillofacial surgery, general surgery, urology, or other medical specialties. Research Requirement Financing Residency Programs A resident physician is more commonly referred to as a resident, senior house officer, or alternatively as a senior resident medical officer or house officer. Residents have graduated from an accredited medical school and hold a medical degree. Residents are, collectively, the house staff of a hospital. This term comes from the fact that resident physicians traditionally spend the majority of their training in-house, i.e., the hospital. Duration of residencies can range from three years to seven years, depending upon the program and specialty. A year in residency begins between late June and early July depending on the individual program, and ends one calendar year later. Depending on the number of years a specialty requires, the term junior resident may refer to residents that have not completed half their residency. Senior residents are residents in their final year of residency. Some residency programs refer to residents in their final year as chief residents. Alternatively, a chief resident may describe a resident who has been selected to extend his or her residency by one year and organize the activities and training of the other residents. If a physician finishes a residency and decides to further his or her education in a fellowship, he or she is referred to as a fellow. Post-residency physicians are referred to as attending physicians, or consultants. However, the above nomenclature applies only in educational institutes in which the period of training is specified in advance. In privately owned, non-training hospitals, in certain countries, the above terminology may reflect the level of responsibility held by a physician rather than their level of education. Changes in Postgraduate Medical Training 
Relation to Personal Debt Residency as an opportunity for advanced training in a medical or surgical specialty evolved in the late 19th century from brief and informal programs for extra training in a special area of interest. The first formal residency programs were established by Sir William Osler and William Stewart Halsted at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Residencies elsewhere then became formalized and institutionalized for the principal specialties in the early 20th century. But even mid-century, residency was not seen as necessary for general practice and only a minority of primary care physicians participated. By the end of the 20th century in North America though, very few new doctors went directly from medical school into independent, unsupervised medical practice, and more state and provincial governments began requiring one or more years of postgraduate training for medical licensure. Residencies are traditionally hospital-based, and in the middle of the 20th century, residents would often live in hospital-supplied housing. Call was sometimes as frequent as every second or third night for up to three years. Pay was minimal beyond room, board, and laundry services. It was assumed that most young men and women training as physicians had few obligations outside of medical training at that stage of their careers. The first year of practical patient care-oriented training after medical school has long been termed internship. Even as late as the middle of the 20th century, most physicians went into primary care practice after a year of internship. Residencies were separate from internship, often served at different hospitals, and only a minority of physicians did residencies. In Afghanistan, the residency consists of a three to seven years of practical and research activities in the field selected by the candidate. The graduate medical students do not need to complete the residency because they study medicine in six years and one year internship and they graduate as general practitioner. Most of students do not complete residency because it is too competitive. In Argentina, the residency consists of a three to four years of practical and research activities in the field selected by both the candidate and already graduated medical practitioners. Specialized fields such as neurosurgery or cardiothoracic surgery require longer training. Through these years, consisting of internships, social services, and occasional research, the resident is classified according to their residency year as an R1, R2, R3, or R4. After the last year, the R3 or R4 resident obtains the specialty in the selected field of medicine. In Colombia, fully licensed physicians are eligible to compete for seats in residency programs. To be fully licensed, one must first finish a medical training program that usually lasts five to six years, followed by one year of medical and surgical internship. During this internship a national medical qualification exam is required, and, in many cases, an additional year of unsupervised medical practice as a social service physician. Applications are made individually program by program and are followed by a postgraduate medical qualification exam. The scores during medical studies, university of medical training, curriculum vitae, and, in individual cases, recommendations are also evaluated. The acceptance rate into residencies is very low, physician resident positions do not have salaries and the tuition fees reach or surpass $10,000 U.S. per year in private universities, and $2,000 U.S. in public universities. For the reasons mentioned above, many physicians travel abroad to seek postgraduate medical training. The duration of the programs varies between three and six years. In public universities, and some private universities, 
it is also required to write and defend a medical thesis before receiving a specialist degree. In France, students attending clinical practice are known as externs and newly qualified practitioners training in hospitals are known as interns. The residency, called internate, lasts from three to five years and follows a competitive national ranking examination. It is customary to delay submission of a thesis. As in most other European countries, many years of practice at a junior level may follow. French residents are often called doctor during their residency. Literally speaking, they are still students and become MD only at the end of their residency and after submitting and defending a thesis before a jury. In Greece, Licensed physicians are eligible to apply for a position in a residency program. To be a licensed physician, one must finish a medical training program which in Greece lasts for six years. A one-year obligatory rural medical service is necessary to complete the residency training. Applications are made individually in the prefecture where the hospital is located and the applicants are positioned on first-come, first-served basis. The salary of a physician resident is €10,000 per year. The duration of the residency programs varies between three and seven years. In Mexico physicians need to take the NARM in order to have a chance for a medical residency in the field he or she wishes to specialize. The physician is allowed to apply to only one speciality each year. Approximately 70,000 physicians apply and only 5,000 will be selected. The selected physicians will bring their certificate of approval to the hospital that they wish to apply. The certificate is valid only once per year and if the resident decides to drop residency and try to enter to a different speciality he will need to take the test one more time. All the hosting hospitals are affiliated to a public-slash-private university and this institution is the responsible to give the degree of specialist. This degree is unique but equivalent to the MD used in the UK and India. In order to graduate, the trainee is required to present a thesis project and defend it. The length of the residencies is very similar to the American system. The residents are divided per year. After finishing the trainee may decide if he wants to subspecialize and the usual length of subspecialty training ranges from two to four years. In Mexico the term fellow is not used. The residents are paid by the hosting hospital, about $1,000 to $1,100 US dollars. Foreign physicians do not get paid and indeed are required to pay an annual fee of $1,000 USD to the university institution that the hospital is affiliated with. All the specialties in Mexico are board certified and some of them have a written and an oral component, making these boards ones of the most competitive in Latin America. In Pakistan after completing MBBS and then a further period of a year in-house job, doctors can enroll in two types of postgraduate residency programs. First is MS-MD program run by various medical universities throughout the country. It is four to five year program depending upon specialty. Second is fellowship program by the College of Physicians and Surgeons. In addition, there are post-fellowship programs by CPSP as a second fellowship in sub-specialties. Currently, all Spanish medical degree holders need to pass a competitive national exam in order to access the specialty training program. This exam gives them the opportunity to choose both the specialty and the hospital where they will train among the hospitals in the Spanish Healthcare Hospital Network. Currently, medical specialties last from four to five years. There are plans to change the training program system in a similar way the UK does. There have been some talks between Ministry of Health, 
the Medical College of Physicians and the Medical Student Association but it is not clear how this change process is going to be. In the United Kingdom, house officer posts used to be optional for those going into general practice, but almost essential for progress in hospital medicine. The Medical Act of 1956 made satisfactory completion of one year as house officer necessary to progress from provisional to full registration as a medical practitioner. The term in turn was not used by the medical profession, but the general public were introduced to it by the U.S. television series about Dr. Kildare. They were usually called housemen but the term resident was also used unofficially. However, in some hospitals the resident medical officer was the most senior of the live-in medical staff of that specialty. The pre-registration house officer posts lasted six months and it was necessary to complete one surgical and one medical post. Obstetrics could be substituted for either. In principle, general practice in a health center was also allowed, but this was almost unheard of. The posts did not have to be in general medicine, some teaching hospitals had very specialized posts at this level so it was possible for a new graduate to do neurology plus neurosurgery or orthopedics plus rheumatology, for one year before having to go on to more broadly based work. The pre-registration posts were nominally supervised by the General Medical Council, which in practice delegated the task to the medical schools, who left it to the consultant medical staff. The educational value of these posts varied enormously. On-call work in the early days was full-time, with frequent night shifts and weekends on call. One night in two was common, and later one night in three. This meant weekends on call started at 9 a.m. on Friday and ended at 5 p.m. on Monday. Less acute specialties such as dermatology could have juniors permanently on call. The European Union's controversial working time directive conflicted with this, at first the UK negotiated an opt-out for some years, but working hours needed reform. On-call time was unpaid until 1975, and for a year or two depended on certification by the consultant in charge a number of them refused to sign. On-call time was at first paid at 30% of the standard rate. Before paid on-call was introduced, there would be several house officers in the house at any one time and the second on-call house officer could go out, provided they kept the hospital informed of their telephone number at all times. A pre-registration house officer would go on to work as a senior house officer for at least one year before seeking a registrar post. Show posts could last six months to a year, and junior doctors often had to travel around the country to attend interviews and move house every six months while constructing their own training scheme for general practice or hospital specialization. Locum posts could be much shorter. Organized schemes were a later development, and do-it-yourself training rotations became rare in the 1990s. Outpatients were not usually a junior house officer's responsibility, but such clinics formed a large part of the workload of more senior trainees, often with little real supervision. Registrar posts lasted one or two years and sometimes much longer outside an academic setting. It was common to move from one registrar post to another. Fields such as psychiatry and radiology used to be entered at the registrar stage, but the other registrars would usually have passed part one of a higher qualification, such as a royal college membership or fellowship before entering that grade. Part 2 was necessary before obtaining a senior registrar post, usually linked to a medical school, but many left hospital practice at this stage rather than wait years to progress to a consultant post. 
Most British clinical diplomas and membership or fellowship exams were not tied to particular training grades, though the length of training and nature of experience might be specified. Participation in an approved training scheme was required by some of the royal colleges. The subspecialty exams in surgery, now for fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons, were originally limited to senior registrars. These rules prevented many of those in non-training grades from qualifying to progress. Once a senior registrar, depending on specialty, it could take anything from one to six years to go on to a permanent consultant and slash or senior lecturer appointment. It might be necessary to obtain an MD or CHM degree and to have substantial published research. Transfer to general practice or a less favoured specialty could be made at any stage along this pathway, Lord Moran famously referred to general practitioners as those who had fallen off the ladder. There are also permanent non-training posts at sub-consultant level, previously senior hospital medical officer and medical assistant and now staff grade, specialty doctor and associate specialist. The regulations do not call for much experience or any higher qualifications, but in practice both are common, and these grades have high proportions of overseas graduates, ethnic minorities, and women. Research fellows and PhD candidates are often clinical assistants, but a few were senior or specialist registrars. A large number of trust grade posts have been created by the new NHS trusts for the sake of the routine work, and many juniors have to spend time in these posts before moving between the new training grades, although no educational or training credit is given for them. Holders of these posts may work at various levels, sharing duties with a junior or middle grade practitioner or with a consultant. The structure of medical training was reformed in 2005 when the Modernizing Medical Careers Reform Program was instituted. House officers and the first year of senior house officer jobs were replaced by a compulsory two-year foundation training program which is followed by competitive entry into a formal specialty-based training program. Registrar and senior registrar grades had been merged in 1995-6 as the specialist registrar grade, with regular local assessments panels playing a major role. Following MMC these posts were replaced by specialty registrars, who may be in post up to eight years, depending on the field. The structure of the training programs vary with specialty but there are five broad categories. The first four categories all run on a similar structure, the trainee first completes a two-year structured and broad-based core training program in that field which makes them eligible for competitive entry into an associated specialty training scheme. The core training years are referred to as CT1 and CT2 and the specialist years are ST3 onwards until completing training. Core training and the first year or two of speciality training are equivalent to the old senior house officer jobs. It is customary for trainees in these areas to sit their membership examinations, or the Royal College of Surgeons in order to progress and compete for designated subspecialty training programs that attract a national training number as specialty training year 3 and beyond, up to ST9 depending on the particular training specialty. Themed core specialties, surgical specialties, medical specialties, psychiatry, run-through specialties. Following a successful residency Step 1 Score Letters of Recommendation in Specialty Personal Statement Most specialties, currently the National Resident Matching Program, abbreviated NRMP by February, Urology Residency Match Program, SF Match, American Osteopathic Association Match in the fifth category, 
the trainee immediately starts specialty training progressing up to consultant level without break or further competitive application process. Most of the run-through schemes are in stand-alone specialties, but there are also a few traditionally surgical specialties which can be entered directly without completing core surgical training, neurosurgery, obstetrics and gynecology and ophthalmology. The length of this training varies, for example general practice is three years while radiology is five years. The UK grade equivalent of a US fellow in medical slash surgical subspecialties is the specialty registrar grade of subspecialty training, but note that while US fellowship programs are generally two three years in duration after completing the residency, UK trainees spend four seven years. This generally includes service provision in the main specialty, this discrepancy lies in the competing demands of NHS service provision and UK postgraduate training stipulating that even specialist registrars must be able to accommodate the general acute medical take almost equivalent to what dedicated attending internists perform in the United States. In some states of the United States, Physicians may usually obtain a general medical license to practice medicine without supervision after completing one year of internship in the state of their license. Many residents have medical licenses and do legally practice medicine without supervision in settings such as urgent care centers and rural hospitals. However, in most residency-related settings, Residents are supervised by attending physicians who must approve of their decision-making. Different specialties differ in length of training, competitiveness size, and options. Programs range from three years for family medicine to over eight years for neurosurgery. Then, for competitiveness, in 2015 there were almost 7,000 positions for internal medicine compared to around 400 positions for dermatology. Finally in regards to options, specialties can range from having over 400 programs to just 26 programs for integrated thoracic surgery. All of these factors are very real factors that affect an applicant's decision beyond what the applicant enjoys in clinical practice. Here is a partial list of the many medical specialties, including There are many factors that can go into what makes an applicant more or less competitive. According to a survey of residency program directors by the NRMP in 2012, the following three factors were mentioned by directors over 71% of the time as having the most impact. Between 50% and 71% also mentioned other factors such as core clerkship grades slash step 2 score slash specialty clerkship grades slash allopathic medical school attendance slash MSBE Dean's letter. These factors often come as a surprise to many students in the preclinical years, who often work very hard to get great grades, but do not realize that only 45% of directors cite basic science performance as an important measure. Applicants begin the application process with ERAs at the beginning of their fourth and final year in medical school. At this point, Students choose specific residency programs to apply for that often specifies both specialty and hospital system, sometimes even subtracts. After they apply to programs, programs review applications and invite selected candidates for interviews held between October and February. As of 2016, schools can view applications starting October 1st. The interview process involves separate interviews at hospitals around the country. Frequently, the individual applicant pays for travel and lodging expenses, but some programs may subsidize applicants' expenses. Generally, an interview begins with a dinner the night before in a relaxed, meet-and-greet setting with current residents and slash or staff. 
Formal interviews with attendings and senior residents are then held the next day, and the applicant tours the program's facilities. Interview questions are primarily related to the applicant's interest in the program and specialty. The purpose of these tasks is to force an applicant into a pressured setting and less to test his or her specific skills. To defray the cost of residency interviews, social networking sites have been devised to allow applicants with common interview dates to share travel expenses. Nonetheless, Additional loans are often required for residency and relocation. International medical students may participate in a residency program within the United States as well but only after completing a program set forth by the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. Through its program of certification, the ECFMG assesses the readiness of international medical graduates to enter residency or fellowship programs in the United States that are accredited by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. Access to graduate medical training programs such as residencies is a competitive process known as the match. After the interview period is over, Students submit a rank order list to a centralized matching service that depends on the residency program they are applying for. Similarly, residency programs submit a list of their preferred applicants in rank order to this same service. The process is blinded, so neither applicant nor program will see each other's list. Aggregate program rankings can be found here and are tabulated in real time based on applicants' anonymously submitted rank lists. The two parties' lists are combined by an NRMP computer, which creates stable matches of residents to programs using an algorithm. On the third Friday of March each year these results are announced in match day ceremonies at the nation's 155 U.S. medical schools. By entering the match system, Applicants are contractually obligated to go to the residency program at the institution to which they were matched. The same applies to the programs, they are obligated to take the applicants who matched into them. On the Monday prior to match day, candidates find out from the NRMP whether they matched. If they have matched, they must wait until the match day to find out where. In 2018, it will be on March 16. Informally called the Scramble, the Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program is process for applicants that did not secure a position through the match, the locations of remaining unfilled residency positions are released to unmatched applicants the following day. These applicants are given the opportunity to contact the programs about the open positions. This frantic, loosely structured system forces soon-to-be medical school graduates to choose programs not on their original match list. In 2012, the NRMP introduced an organized scramble system. As part of the transition, match day was also moved from the third Thursday in March to the third Friday. Inevitably, there will be discrepancies between the preferences of the student and programs. Students may be matched to programs very low on their rank list, especially when the highest priorities consist of competitive specialties like radiology, neurosurgery, plastic surgery, dermatology, ophthalmology, orthopedics, otolaryngology, radiation oncology, and urology. It is not unheard of for a student to go even a year or two in a residency and switching to a new program. A similar but separate osteopathic match exists which announces its results in February, before the NRMP. Osteopathic physicians may participate in either match, filling either MD positions accredited by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education or DO positions accredited by the American Osteopathic Association. 
Military residencies are filled in a similar manner as the NRMP however at a much earlier date to allow for students who did not match to proceed to the civilian system. In 2000-2004 the matching process was attacked as anti-competitive by resident physicians represented by class action lawyers. C. E.G. Jung v. Association of American Medical Colleges ETAL, 300F.Sub.2D119 Congress reacted by carving out a specific exception in antitrust law for medical residency. See Pension Funding Equity Act of 2004-207, PUBL No. 108-218, 118 STAT 596. The lawsuit was later dismissed under the authority of the new act. The matching process itself has also been scrutinized as limiting the employment rights of medical residents, namely where upon acceptance of a match, medical residents pursuant to the matching rules and regulations, are required to accept any and all terms and conditions of employment imposed by the health care facility, institution, or hospital. The Azimal Step 1 or Comlex Level 1 score is just one of many factors considered by residency programs in selecting applicants. Although it varies from specialty to specialty, Alpha Omega Alpha membership, clinical clerkship grades, letters of recommendation, class rank, research experience, and school of graduation are all considered when selecting future residents. See main article on medical resident work hours. Medical residencies traditionally require lengthy hours of their trainees. Early residents literally resided at the hospitals, often working in unpaid positions during their education. During this time, a resident might always be on call or share that duty with just one other practitioner. More recently, 36-hour shifts were separated by 12 hours of rest during 100-plus hour weeks. The American public, and the medical education establishment, recognized that such long hours were counterproductive, since sleep deprivation increases rates of medical errors. This was noted in a landmark study on the effects of sleep deprivation and error rate in an intensive care unit. The Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education has limited the number of work hours to 80 hours weekly, overnight call frequency to no more than one overnight every third day, and 10 hours off between shifts. Still, a review committee may grant exceptions for up to 10%, or a maximum of 88 hours, to individual programs. Until early 2017, Duty periods for postgraduate year 1 could not exceed 16 hours per day, while postgraduate year 2 residents and in those in subsequent years can have duty periods up to a maximum of 24 hours of continuous duty. After early 2017, all years of residents may work up to 24-hour shifts. While these limits are voluntary, Adherence has been mandated for the purposes of accreditation, the lack of adherence to our restrictions is not uncommon. Most recently, the Institute of Medicine built upon the recommendations of the ACME in the December 2008 report Resident Duty Hours, Enhancing Sleep, Supervision and Safety. While keeping the ACME's recommendations of an 80 hour work week averaged over four weeks, the IOM report recommends that duty hours should not exceed 16 hours per shift, unless an uninterrupted 5-hour break for sleep is provided within shifts that last up to 30 hours. The report also suggests residents be given variable off-duty periods between shifts, based on the timing and duration of the shift, to allow residents to catch up on sleep each day and make up for chronic sleep deprivation on days off.
Critics of long residency hours trace the problem to the fact that a resident has no alternatives to positions that are offered, meaning residents must accept all conditions of employment, including very long work hours, and that they must also, in many cases, contend with poor supervision. This process, they contend, reduces the competitive pressures on hospitals, resulting in low salaries and long, unsafe work hours. Supporters of traditional work hours contend that much may be learned in the hospital during the extended time. Some argue that it remains unclear whether patient safety is enhanced or harmed by a reduction in work hours which necessarily lead to more transitions in care. Some of the clinical work traditionally performed by residents has been shifted to other healthcare workers such as ward clerks, nurses, laboratory personnel, and phlebotomists. It has also resulted in a shift of some resident work towards home work, where residents will complete paperwork and other duties at home as to not have to log the hours. United States federal law places no limit on resident work hours. Regulatory and legislative attempts at limiting resident work hours have been proposed, but have yet to be passed. Class action litigation on behalf of the 200,000 medical residents in the U.S. has been another route taken to resolve the matter. Dr. Richard Corlin, president of the American Medical Association, has called for re-evaluation of the training process, declaring we need to take a look again at the issue of why the resident is there. On November 1, 2002, an 80-hour work limit went into effect in residencies accredited by the American Osteopathic Association. The decision also mandates that interns and residents in AOA-approved programs may not work in excess of 24 consecutive hours exclusive of morning and noon educational programs. It does allow up to six hours for inpatient and outpatient continuity and transfer of care. However, interns and residents may not assume responsibility for a new patient after 24 hours. The U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration rejected a petition filed by the Committee of Interns and Residents slash SEU, a national union of medical residents, the American Medical Student Association, and public citizen that sought to restrict medical resident work hours. OSHA instead opted to rely on standards adopted by ACME a private trade association that represents and accredits residency programs. On July 1, 2003, the ACME instituted standards for all accredited residency programs, limiting the work week to 80 hours a week averaged over a period of four weeks. These standards have been voluntarily adopted by residency programs. Though reaccreditation may be negatively impacted and accreditation suspended or withdrawn for program noncompliance, the number of hours worked by residents still varies widely between specialties and individual programs. Some programs have no self-policing mechanisms in place to prevent 100-plus hour work weeks while others require residents to self-report hours. In order to effectuate complete, full, and proper compliance with maximum hour work hour standards, there are proposals to extend U.S. federal whistleblower protection to medical residents. Criticisms of limiting the work week include disruptions in continuity of care and limiting training gained through involvement in patient care. Similar concerns have arisen in Europe where the Working Time Directive limits doctors to 48 hours per week averaged out over a six-month reference period. Recently, there has been talk of reducing the work week further, to 57 hours. In the specialty of neurosurgery, some authors have suggested that surgical subspecialties may need to leave the ACME and create their own accreditation process because a decrease of this magnitude in resident work hours, if implemented, 
would compromise resident education and ultimately the quality of physicians in practice. It should be noted, however, that in other areas of medical practice, like internal medicine, pediatrics, and radiology, reduced resident duty hours may be not only feasible but advantageous to trainees because this more closely resembles the practice patterns of these specialties, though it has never been determined that trainees should work fewer hours than graduates. In 2007, the Institute of Medicine was commissioned by Congress to study the impact of long hours on medical errors. New UCMI rules went into effect on July 1, 2011 limiting first-year residents to 16-hour shifts. The new UCMI rules were criticized in the journal Nature and Science of Sleep for failing to fully implement the IOM recommendations. The Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education clearly states the following three points in the Common Program Requirements for Graduate Medical Education. Research remains a non-mandatory part of the curriculum and many residency programs do not enforce the research commitment of their faculty leading to a non-Gaussian distribution of the research productivity scale. The Department of Health and Human Services primarily Medicare, funds the vast majority of residency training in the U.S. This tax-based financing covers resident salaries and benefits through payments called direct medical education or DME payments. Medicare also uses taxes for indirect medical education or IME payments, a subsidy paid to teaching hospitals that is tied to admissions of Medicare patients in exchange for training resident physicians in certain selected specialties. Overall funding levels, however, have remained frozen over the last 10 years, creating a bottleneck in the training of new physicians in the U.S., according to the AMA. On the other hand, some argue that Medicare subsidies for training residents simply provide surplus revenue for hospitals which recoup their training costs by paying residents salaries that are far below the residents' market value. Nicholson concludes that residency bottlenecks are not caused by a Medicare funding cap, but rather, by residency review committees which seek to limit the number of specialists in their field to maintain high incomes. In any case, hospitals trained residents long before Medicare provided additional subsidies for that purpose. A large number of teaching hospitals fund resident training to increase the supply of residency slots, leading to the modest 4% total growth in slots from 1998-2004. Many changes have occurred in postgraduate medical training in the last 50 years. In a survey of more than 15,000 residents in internal medicine, approximately 19% of residents with more than $200,000 in debt designated their quality of life as bad, compared with approximately 12% of those with no debt. Also, residents with more than $200,000 in loans scored 5 points lower on internal medicine in training exam than those who were debt-free. In Australia and New Zealand, it leads to eligibility for fellowship of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, or a number of similar bodies. In Canada, once medical doctors successfully complete their residency program, they become eligible for certification by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada or the College of Family Physicians of Canada if the residency program was in family medicine. Many universities now offer enhanced skills certifications in collaboration with the CFPC, allowing family physicians to receive training in various areas such as emergency medicine, palliative care, maternal and child health care, and hospital medicine. Additionally, successful graduates of the Family Medicine Residency Program can apply to the Clinical Scholar Program in order to be involved in family medicine research.
In Mexico, after finishing their residency, physicians obtain the degree of specialist, which renders them eligible for certification and fellowship, depending on the field of practice. In South Africa, successful completion of residency leads to board certification as a specialist with the Health Professions Council and eligibility for fellowship of the Colleges of Medicine of South Africa. In the United States, it leads to eligibility for board certification and membership-slash-fellowship of several specialty colleges and academies.